Okay, I believe we are live and welcome everyone to the CT Tech Junkie coverage of the launch of Rick Mastracchio. He is the Waterbury native who is launching to the International Space Station tonight. We have uh, NASA TV live uh, running here at the same time. We're also uh, joined by uh, Doug Hardy, who's uh, the other half of CT News Junkie. Hey, Doug, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. So Doug's going to kind of guide us through here. We had, um, unfortunately, our, our NASA expert um, had a family emergency. He couldn't make it on tonight. So uh, we will do our best on our own here. But we do have uh, someone on the phone with us right now from uh, Waterbury. And uh, this is uh, Robert uh, Sizakis, right? Is that how you pronounce it, Robert? Yes, Sizakis. And uh, Robert is uh, with the Waterbury Police uh, Activity League, and he's done a lot to uh, connect uh, kids in Waterbury to, um, uh, to this launch. And uh, we wanted to get him on briefly just to kind of talk about uh, some of the things that uh, he's been doing with the kids. So, so uh, Robert, so I guess we had, um, uh, there's a geocaching travel bug and a whole bunch of other stuff. What have the kids been doing with, uh, with Rick Mastracchio here in, in preparation for the launch? So that's it. Yeah, Rick Mastracchio has decided uh, he agreed to take a geocaching travel bug with him to the International Space Station when he launches tonight at 11 to 14 p.m. Eastern time um, from Kazakhstan. And um, he's taking it with him um, along with 11 uh, small hitchhiker tags that are attached to this travel bug, uh, representing 11 schools from Waterbury, Connecticut. And uh, all these 11 schools are watching along on his journey. The kids have been asking questions and uh, interacting with him all throughout his uh, training from Houston to Germany to Star City, Russia, and now to uh, Kazakhstan, where he'll be launching tonight the International Space Station. So all of the kids in the public schools in Waterbury, where Rick uh, graduated from, are very excited and uh, very enthusiastic about, uh, about this launch and learning more about space travel and science and engineering. And I guess there's a, a lot of people there tonight. So there's a lot of, a lot of folks pretty excited about um, this launch, I guess it sounds like, right? That's right, yeah. So Rick has been in space three times on um, some short missions. He's, he's under 40 days in space total. He'll be spending six months at 180 days uh, in space now. So this is really the, uh, you know, the top of his career. He graduated from the public school system in Waterbury, Connecticut. It's an urban environment. There are a lot of challenges involved with that. So it's a real inspiration to all the kids and, um, and students in the public schools in Waterbury. And, and everyone in Waterbury is very excited that he's willing to take time out uh, through his training to interact with the kids and, and try to give back and uh, remember where he came from. And, and so what, what are some of the, the, the reaction there in the room tonight? Is, is there a lot of uh, excitement, it sounds like, to see this, uh, this Soyuz finally take off? Yeah, that's it. everyone's very excited. And... Uh, you know, there's geocaches from all around. I, I talked to you from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York, um, and, and they travel long distances to come and watch this and just uh, see some history happen tonight here, um, right from Waterbury, Connecticut. So it, it's a packed house. There's hundreds of people uh, stuffed into this place here. And, and how many kids want to be an astronaut now, do you think? Uh, they, every, all the kids that I talked to, once I tell them that the, you know, the astronaut came from there's the same classrooms that they sit in. Everyone's so excited that they, uh, you know, everyone's just interested in being an astronaut, and it just opens up so many doors and, and ideas. Regardless if they're an astronaut, maybe they want to be a doctor or a policeman, fireman, whatever they want to be, it's, it's, it's a real possibility, and that's the inspiration and the message that we're trying to deliver. And if people want to get more information on what the uh, Waterbury Police Activity League is doing, where should they go online to look for that? The best place to go is uh, www.waterburypal.org. We've uh, included all of the links and all the media coverage and, and all the information on what we're doing with uh, Ashton Rick Mastracchio on our website. So the best place to visit, again, is www.waterburypal.org. Well, great. Robert, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, thanks for your help uh, getting some of those, uh, uh, those videos. We did a, a video on CT Tech Junkie of, uh, of the kids asking uh, Rick some questions. We got up really early in the morning to uh, talk to him via satellite and we really uh, appreciate your help with that. So let me, uh, I don't want to keep you from, uh, from the celebration okay. over there in Waterbury. I know there's, there's probably a lot of, uh, a lot of chicken wings over there at the, uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the wings place you're at, right? Yeah, it's, uh, everybody's eating here and having a good time and those videos that you talked about are all on our website at waterburycow.org. Great, well thank you very much for joining us and uh, we'll let you go. Thank you. Bye. Yep, bye-bye.
So uh, there you have it. That's uh, Robert from uh, uh, the Waterbury Police Action League and uh, Activity League. And they were doing quite a bit for these kids to get them involved with it. So, um, so Doug, we, we should probably talk to people about, about Rick Mistracchio, who is the astronaut we're watching uh, lift off tonight. So he is a real veteran of the NASA space program. In fact, he um, has flown on, he flew on every one of the remaining shuttles. So he was on Atlantis, Endeavor, and Discovery. He, uh, he seems like he's got a lot more experience than, uh, than most of the astronauts, if I'm not mistaken. It's just like a lot of different missions there. Yeah, he's been, uh, he was, he's been on a number of, uh, of missions, including uh, the prepping of the ISS for habitation, which was the, uh, the first mission that he was on. It was uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis in 2000, and uh, he was actually one of the folks that got the, uh, the, the uh, International Space Station ready for people to live on. Um, he did a number of spacewalks uh, during a couple of other missions as well, so he's... Uh, he's definitely been uh, a, a very seasoned astronaut. We interviewed him um, a little while ago. We'll pull up that video in a little bit of our, uh, of our interview with him to uh, kind of get the, at least a little bit from, from him and, and some questions from the kids as well. So let me just pull back up the, uh, the NASA view. We're watching some NASA footage of, uh, this is NASA television, and they are uh, broadcasting uh, some B-roll right now, but we'll see some live shots from, uh, from there later. Um, so he flew on STS-106, which was Atlantis in 2000. He also flew on STS-118, which was uh, uh, in 2007, and he added one of the truss segments to the International Space Station. So he actually had to get out uh, and spacewalk to do that. And uh, he also flew on Discovery in uh, April of 2010, and that mission uh, he was, uh, did about 20 hours of spacewalking during the course of that mission. So he's, he's really one of the more experienced astronauts remaining uh, there right now. Uh, he's joined how by... Many, uh, sorry, go ahead, how many hours, how many hours uh, does it take to get around uh, for a full orbit? It's only 90 minutes. So it's, so it's 90 minutes. So he's done quite a few. Yeah, he's, he's flown around the world a couple of times. And uh, he's, in, again, it's uh, three space shuttle flights is pretty significant. And uh, he's going to be going up to the ISS for about a five or six month uh, flight. So this is probably the longest he'll have been in orbit before, so or ever. So um, he'll definitely uh, be feeling the effects when he gets back. He's joined by uh, two other um, astronauts, actually an astronaut from uh, Japan, Kochi Wakata, and he's from the Japanese space agency, it's called JAXA, and Mikhail T uh, Tyron, who's a cosmonaut from Russia. So it's a uh, truly an international mission. You can see uh, they were getting ready for, they were getting fitted into their seats. Now in the, the Soyuz, which is the Russian spacecraft that they'll be flying on, uh, the Soyuz spacecraft uh, has customized seats for every astronaut. So they actually design a seat uh, just custom for each one. So they're, they're, what you're really? seeing here on the screen right now is a fit test that they were doing uh, to get them ready for it. Uh, Rick Mastracchi is a little bit taller than most astronauts too. So um, he uh, certainly has his own seat as well. And the reason why they do this is that when they, when they land, it is a pretty rough landing. So uh, there, there's a parachute uh, that will deploy from it. And unlike the uh, US spacecraft that land in the water, uh, the um, Russian uh, spacecraft actually land on a big uh, open plane <laughs> on, on ground. Uh, and they, they hit and there's a little rocket that fires right before it smacks into the ground. But uh, one astronaut I spoke to a few, a few months ago about this said it was like being in a car accident. So it's not, <laughs> it's not um, wow. uneventful. And it, and it does, uh, you know, if you, if you think about it, if you've been weightless for six months and you come back to Earth uh, and you get whacked into the ground like that, it cannot... Uh, feel good, so I think uh, it's definitely. You know, they say water. They say to. water is harder than the than than the ground after at certain speeds. But I, I got a feeling that uh, the Soyuz landings are a lot worse than than floating out in the Pacific. Of course, there's always the fear that you'll sink. Yeah, there's all sorts of uh, issues that you run into, and actually, on the Soyuz, they they keep a shotgun on board uh, because there are there have been times when the uh, the, the orbit burn you know didn't fire correctly or something. Uh, went awry and they, they didn't get hurt or killed, but they ended up significantly off course. And sometimes it takes a while for them to be found. And uh, right. they go through some survival right. training where they actually uh, prepare to be, you know, spend multiple days out in the wilderness. Uh, and they have a, a shotgun on board to deal with the animals that might, <laughs> might come their way um, when they're there. So uh, that we'll just goes to show you the, de uh, the degrees of accuracy. It doesn't, you don't have to be off by much to be a long way from home. That's no, it's very true, and it's uh, it you know you, you the, there's it is rocket science after all, and they have to be really prepared for that. So, um, so yeah, so Rick Mastracchio is a veteran of three space flights, and uh, he has uh, certainly uh, done some amazing stuff out there. We're gonna I'm gonna pull up a video here that we can play of while we're waiting for 
Uh, some more footage to come Most in from Kazakhstan here. We'll just wait for this uh, ad to play off. Uh, we'll play the video that we, uh, that we shot with, uh, thanks to Robert's help, uh, with the kids there. So let me just get through the, uh, the ad here and we'll pop it over to our other window and play this real quick for everybody. Let me just pull up a thing here. And we're, we are learning as we go here with, uh, with this process. This has been, uh, it's been an interesting night. We, we've changed uh, some gear around and it's been a little difficult to get things going, but uh, let me, let me uh, play this, uh, this video for you all now. And we'll put the sound up here. He will launch to the station again for a nearly six-month mission on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft next month. Mastrakio joined us for an interview via satellite from Star City, Russia this week, and we asked some Waterbury Elementary students to supply the questions. They're practically in a crouch. What inspired you to be an astronaut, and what did you learn while in Waterbury Public Schools that helped prepare you to be an astronaut? Well, I can remember, I went to Chase Grammar School a few years back, and I can remember when I was, was there, I loved when my teachers were talking about the planets and, and, and anything related to science. I was also, I also enjoyed math, believe it or not. So I think just my interest in math and my love of science and studying the planets just uh, naturally, naturally led for me to, to become an engineer. And then I was lucky enough to get selected as an astronaut after a lot of hard work. What has been the most challenging part of preparing for your six-month expedition? Yeah, that, that's a good question. You know, training to fly a spacecraft is obviously quite difficult, but it was, uh, it was also very exciting for me to learn how to fly a new vehicle. But the most challenging part was probably the fact that I had to learn how to speak and understand the Russian language. It's a, it's a difficult language, and, uh, you know, being an engineer, I'm not real good at languages, but uh, I was able to, uh, uh, to master it and got through all that. How do you drink liquid in space without gravity? Is there a special type of food you have to eat in space? Well, to drink flu, uh, to drink uh, water or juices or things like that, uh, probably a lot of the kids are familiar with the uh, kind of the uh, the drink packets in the in the uh, in the envelopes where you just poke a straw in it and drink the uh, and drink the water or the juice out of the uh, the plastic bag, if you will. That's what we use in space. It's very similar to things you could buy at the grocery store here. And in terms of space food, the space station has a wide variety of food, and it's all very tasty, actually. Uh, but of course, I can't go anywhere without uh, my peanut butter, so I got to have a peanut butter sandwich when I'm up there. But unfortunately, we don't have bread, so we use tortillas. And while many of his colleagues are leaving the space agency, Mistrakio says he has no plans to leave after his mission concludes in March. I once in a while I have a thought about the future, but I don't plan on leaving NASA. I plan I, uh, right now. I plan on sticking around after this mission, and I think it's going to be some exciting times with some of these new vehicles coming online, and I, I'd like to be part of that. Those new vehicles include the NASA SLS and Orion spacecraft that will go beyond low Earth orbit, but also commercial spacecraft by SpaceX, Boeing, and others. Uh, I think it's great. It's great to have the, uh, the U.S. companies building spacecraft and delivering cargo to the International Space Station. Of course, the next step is to start delivering people to the space station or to low Earth orbit and wherever that may lead. I think it's great. I look forward to when I get back from this mission work, working with the commercial companies or working on NASA's uh, new Orion vehicle in some way. Mistrakio says he plans to return to Connecticut following his mission's completion in March. One of the activities will be returning a geocaching travel bug that Waterbury students gave him for his flight. A special thank you to the Waterbury Police Activity League for lining up the students' questions. For CTTechJunkie.com, this is Lon Seidman. So that is... Uh that was a little video we did earlier in the week, so it was uh, really nice of uh, everyone to help us out to get the video of that put together. Uh, and uh, we are just waiting on uh, some NASA information here to see what uh, the status of the mission is. They're, they're running some, uh, some B-roll right now, again, of them uh, getting uh, suited up and, uh, and put onto the, uh, uh, into the uh, uh, spacecraft that they will be launching from very shortly. So. Um, pretty exciting stuff, so we'll kind of let this run. Now, what we have uh, up on the screen now, Doug, is a picture of uh, the astronauts next to their boosters that will take them into orbit. So there's, a, I think it's a two-stage rocket, so uh, it'll be pretty, uh, pretty neat to watch this thing take off. And uh, it's very reliable. They've, this is a design that's been really tried and true for a, a good portion of the Russian space program. It's, it's, it's been modernized, so it's not the same rocket that they would fire off in the 60s, but um, it is... Uh, definitely using that heritage. So it's, uh, it's been extremely reliable in the past. And, and uh, they also have uh, the ability, there's an escape tower on it also, so they can actually get away from it if something, uh, God forbid, were to occur there. So 
Um, so that is uh, kind of the, the gist of the launch. Let's talk about that for a second. In terms of, uh, I, I, I'm sure a lot of the people who may be listening to this know what's been going on with the space program and and uh, the end of the shuttle program. But, but what are the what are your your numbers? What's what are the probabilities of getting these things off the ground uh, without a delay or without a problem in comparison to the space shuttle program? Well, you know, it's interesting. They're they're in the process right now of of trying to come up with these commercial spacecraft to replace, you know, the uh, the shuttle. And um, they're 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 making progress, except the fact that it's actually very difficult to <laughs> to go into space. And uh, a lot of these commercial providers like SpaceX are are really new to the to the to the routine. Boeing uh, is involved with it also, as you know. Boeing is. Uh, uh, constructed a lot of uh, the portions of the International Space Station, so they're kind of the safe bet uh, in all of this. But, um, you know, th there's, it's a very long process, and they didn't have these vehicles ready by the time the shuttle was retired. So uh, we're relying upon the Russians. We're, we're paying, uh, I think, uh, in excess of 20 or $25 million per seat on the Russian spacecraft. So, um, you know, the Russians are certainly uh, making some money off of this in the, uh, in the process of getting this uh, put together. But um, at the same time, you know, that's our only way to get, in, get into space at the moment. And uh, there are, uh, so basically right now there's three vehicles. Boeing has one. It's called the, uh, the CST-100, I believe. And it's a capsule that will attach to an Atlas V rocket, which right now is just launching satellites, but will be modified to uh, support some space capsules similar to the Soyuz in many ways. Uh, we also have uh, SpaceX has their spacecraft called the Dragon, and that um, has been delivering cargo now. They've done three missions to the space station with cargo, but not people. Uh, and that launches on their own rocket called the Falcon 9. So that, that's uh, in, in making progress, although they're not there yet with the, uh, the human tests. Uh, there will be a trial soon of the SpaceX abort system, and we're going to try to get down for that launch, where they're going to launch the rocket uh, and then fire the capsule off the top of it, um, which is going to be pretty cool. This is a live shot, by the way, from... Uh, Kazakhstan, and this is the rocket. Rick Mastrakia is in there right now, along with his two crewmates, and uh, he's in there. And uh, uh, getting back to SpaceX for a minute, though, they uh, Doug just uh, asked me a question about whether or not they've had problems with it, and they they have actually. The um, the last launch was successful in its prime mission, but they uh, had an issue uh, igniting the the booster for another stage to get uh, into a higher orbit. So the the Dragon is still, and the Falcon 9 from SpaceX are still kind of being worked out. There's still some some issues with that, and they're not quite. Uh, where they need to be just yet with that. And what you're seeing right now are pictures of uh, the Russian Soyuz craft getting uh, uh, put together in its launch pad there and some graphics of how the whole thing works. And, you know, this is a very tried and true system that really works quite well. And uh, SpaceX is building something new from scratch. And it takes some time to try to figure out uh, what all the issues are and, and where some of the, the gotchas might be in their design before they, they put people in there. Uh, the third vehicle, that a commercial vehicle that's going to come onto the scene is a little mini space shuttle. And it's, called, it's from a, a company called Sierra Nevada, uh, Sierra, um, yeah, I think it's Sierra, Sierra Nevada Corporation. And they have a, a little mini space shuttle, which uh, just had its first flight. Uh, it didn't go into space, but they dropped it off from a helicopter to see if it could glide. Uh, and it did, <laughs> which was good for them, um, that it could do that. However, when it, when it landed, uh, the landing gear failed, and it flipped over and became severely damaged. So, uh, Doug, we've got some, got some problems there <laughs> with that one, and I think it's going to take a while for them to uh, get that uh, thing rebuilt. And, you know, that's one of the issues with these commercial spaceflight providers is that when NASA has an accident, it's a very public and transparent thing. It's government property, and uh, taxpayers, of course, have a right to know. And in the case of uh, the accident involving that mini space shuttle last week, there wasn't um, really any uh, video of it, nor any word officially of what, how severe the damage was, if at all. Uh, that right. vehicle is partially funded by taxpayers, not fully, but um, you know, they, they showed a video of it landing and going through all its motions, but we don't get to actually see the part where it crashed. So, um, and they're quick to say that it- that Part it, of the, uh, the slippery slope of switching over to privately funded uh, space programs. I mean, we knew that this was coming. We knew we weren't going to get all the answers or right. full access, but... That's, that's exactly it. And this is the kind of stuff that you deal with. So we'll have to see where that goes. This is a neat shot uh, from NASA TV right now. This is the inside of the Soyuz. Not very big in there, is it? Um, no. So <laughs> they, You cannot uh, be claustrophobic to be an astronaut. These things are very cramped. What's interesting is they used to take a couple of days to get uh, to get to the space station. Now, there's another component to this. There's a little tiny living space in there as well. It's not much bigger than the capsule that they're sitting in. But um, they, um, 
used to st spend a couple days in here to get to the space station. They have now worked out a way to only make the journey a couple of hours. So uh, it's not as uncomfortable for them as it used to be. They used to be stuck in this thing for a couple of days before it, it actually caught up to the space station. Now they're uh, launching and docking, I think within s under six or seven hours. So it's, it's more like a, a drive to DC in a, in a, from Connecticut in a, <laughs> a tiny minivan. So um, this is the hatch that uh, seals them in. And then uh, I believe what we're seeing under there, let's take a look at the video here. I think what they're showing is, yeah, this is the living quarters there. Not much bigger. It's amazing how it, everything, it, it doesn't look new. <laughs> everything, <laughs> it really does still look like it's from the 70s. Yeah, 60s and 70s. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. if it works, it works. And I think that's that's right. part of it. And what's interesting is, is how um, different the space programs between the U.S. and the Russians were in that uh, in the 60s, you know, the U.S. went for distance, not duration. Uh, and the Russians really focused on du long duration space flight. And uh, the partnership has been really interesting between the U.S. and Russia because they've they've brought together uh, two very different experiences where, you know, again, we really focused on distance flight and, uh, you know, raising the bar on aeronautics. And, and the Russians really stayed with a design for them that worked and figured out ways to, to allow people to stay in space longer. As you can recall, the uh, Mir space station was um, was out there before as well. So. Uh, we will see uh, what happens here. So, this is so it's only going to take them a couple hours to get up there, right? Yeah, it's about six or seven hours, exactly, exactly. It's I think we're about uh, half an hour away from from launch at this point. So we'll see uh, where things go. And it's a shame our, our NASA expert couldn't join us because he's got all sorts of. Uh, he could build one of these things, actually. So I tell you, that is remarkable. It's really cool. So uh, let me pull up uh, these. These uh, the Soyuz rockets are. How do they compare uh, in size to? the stuff that went to the moon and and uh, orbited the moon, maybe not the ones that landed. But either way, they're, they're still, those were much larger, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, significantly, yeah. The, the, um, so it, what's, what's really amazing is, especially when you see these things, they're not tiny. They are really rather, rather large and imposing. Oh, well, uh, we, we, were down, we were down at uh, NASA uh, a few years ago, and we got a look at the Dragon rocket, and it seemed big, but... It didn't seem anywhere near as big as uh, the the vehicle assembly building could house. Yeah, it, uh, house. Yeah, these these are a lot smaller. I mean, I, I would say that, and I, I don't have the measurements on hand, but I would say that this the Soyuz is probably you know not as tall as the space shuttle was, but it, but it's close. The Dragon is about the same height as the space shuttle to, from top to bottom. Uh, the Apollo rocket, which took uh, people to the moon, was twice the size. So yeah. it, it it was significantly bigger, mainly because you have to carry all of your everything with you, your fuel, your right. food, your, you know, your oxygen tanks, everything that you need to uh, live on orbit and get home, uh, you have to carry with you. So, so that's one of the challenges of, of space flight is that uh, you know, these rockets are extremely heavy at launch because uh, they, they have to carry all the fuel they need to get home. They also need to carry all the fuel to get them off the ground. So uh, they get a lot lighter as they go. And it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, design challenge because you have to factor in you know, the fact that the uh, vehicle will be lighter uh, minutes after it launches than when it is when it when it does fire off uh, these rockets stage also so what and I I think we might actually have a good view of it too because it is daylight in Kazakhstan right now um, so we'll probably see a good view of the rockets separating as it's going up so there's a second stage that uh, will the, the top part will detach from the bottom part so once the uh, those first rounds of boosters have, have expended their fuel you you shed the weight and then uh, continue onward there so uh, it looks kind of tiny, uh, you know, compared to the to the barren landscape there. But these rockets are not in, insignificantly small. They're they're pretty big. Uh, well, everything's more lightweight now too, I'm sure. And uh, I guess what's really neat about this is that there's a guy from Waterbury on board. Yeah, no, he he went to the Waterbury schools. Um, as you saw in the video, he uh, you know gave a shout out shout out to his uh, elementary school that he went to, and, <laughs> and now he's uh, making his fourth flight into space. And it's uh, it's pretty exciting to watch. Uh, someone native from Connecticut doing that. So I think we're about 25 minutes away from launch. We'll keep, uh, we'll keep running some of these things there as we, as we go. Um, I was chatting with somebody about uh, space flight and, and uh, what happens to astronauts while they're up there. And, and so uh, Rick Mastracchio has been up there for 20 hours in, in spacewalk. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the forces are. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not sure if you know a whole lot about this, Lon, but I, I'll throw it out there. What, what happens to the human body when you're in space that bring, you know, it, it, they come back, they're pretty weak. Uh, so obviously gravity's part of it, lack of gravity. 
Is yeah. there anything else? Yeah, well, there's, yeah, the, the lack of gravity is a big problem, and they actually do a lot of exercise while they're up there. Um, in fact, uh, Stephen Colbert had a treadmill named after him, um, and, and if, <laughs> apparently there's a NASA rule against naming things after people, so they found some acronym that could work with Colbert. Um, but they, uh, they, they strap themselves down to it, and, and they run. They have weight lift, weight training, and everything else. And, um, it is, and if you ever watch some of the videos after they come back, especially on the Soyuz, they, they often cannot get up on their own um, because their muscles have been weakened from, from you know, all of the, uh, the, the lack of gravity and the lack of those muscles being exercised uh, while, they're, while they're in orbit. So um, it is a pretty rough transition for a lot of them. Some do better than others. Um, I met uh, astronaut Katie Coleman, who, who, by the way, was a big part of that movie Gravity that just came out. Uh, but we interviewed her about it two years ago when we were there for one of the final space shuttle launches. And uh, she did better than others, uh, she said. But, you know, it's still a pretty, you know, pretty tough adjustment because you go from weighing nothing, uh, being able to fly around everywhere you want to go, to all of a sudden having the whole weight of the world literally on, on you. And, and it really, uh, you, they get sick um, for, for quite a while. And there's a lot of things that they try to do to make it better. Uh, one thing Katie Coleman was doing when she was uh, on that flight was uh, trying to... Um, she was doing an osteoporosis study to, to actually study her bone density in orbit, and it was testing a few different medications to uh, see how that works, and, and not just to help astronauts, but also to help people on Earth who are suffering from osteoporosis because they do have bone loss while in space. They do have muscle loss while in space. Um, they've also discovered that there's some uh, retina um, problems with their eyes, that the, uh, the eye changes its shape slightly, and, and sometimes that's permanent. So. Um, there is a, a considerable amount that they're still learning about, uh, you know, long duration space flight and being, being up there for as long as they are. And uh, I don't know if the Russians spent as much time on, on, on the medical side of this as the, as the Americans have been spending with it. So, um, but there are some significant I issues there. And part of what all of this is about is getting to do long journeys to Mars and other places. And, uh, you know, the, the, the mission that's next on the agenda for, uh, for NASA is actually kind of ambitious. They want to go and uh, capture a asteroid, um, and it sounds like total crazy science fiction, but this is, this is the plan. Uh, the goal is to capture an asteroid with a robotic spaceship, uh, send astronauts out beyond the orbit of the moon to go um, uh, attach themselves to it, grab samples, and come back to, uh, to Earth with it. So um, that's going to take some time out in space, and you have to factor in that length of time for their bodies. What do we need to put on that spacecraft that they're going to be traveling with to keep that muscle tone up? Um, what kind of radiation are they going to deal with when they, when they get into space and, and, have, and are away from uh, the Earth's atmosphere and its protective uh, qualities there? There's a lot, you know, a lot to it. Um, so that's, that was the other question I was wondering is, is, do we know what kind of radiation exposure we're talking about, uh, you know, in orbit around the Earth versus in orbit around the moon? I'm sure there's a, uh, quite a significant amount of radiation uh, on the bright side of the moon. Actually, it's everywhere. Uh -huh. And when, when the minute they get off, get out of the atmosphere, you're, you're suddenly exposed to a lot, a lot more radiation. And in fact, um, the astronauts, they have um, bunks on the ISS, by the way, International Space Station. It's, it's very big. In fact, this is the first time that astronauts have actually had cabins to sleep in. They have, they're not big, <laughs> but they're, um, they have these tiny little sleep quarters to sleep in. And my understanding is they actually uh, have water that is surrounding them, or at least uh, you know, bags of water that, that are on their back to try to absorb some of the excess radiation they might be um, getting hit with out there. Uh, partly because you know, you're, you're out in interstellar space, essentially, not interstellar, but out in outer space. Uh, the sun has, uh, gives off a lot of radiation in a variety right. of different forms. And the big concerns are when you have those solar flares, uh, which are you know, just very powerful ejections of, of solar matter, which includes a lot of radioactive material that uh, comes flying at you. So. Uh, it's a big, it's a big concern, and it's a huge concern for going to Mars, where it might take you know a number of months to get there, and you're really you know quite exposed in, the, in that in that right. Area. And you can't make you can't make these uh, these spacecrafts out uh, spacecraft out of lead in order to you know yeah. you have to get out of out of the uh, Earth's gravity first of all. Yeah, it's and there's no there's no atmosphere to protect it. We have miles of atmosphere that protect us here, so it's interesting. So it isn't just the gravity; it's it's the radiation. Yep, it's the radiation. And, uh, it's the it's the grav lack of gravity. It's um, you know it's all all of those those things that come into play. And and you know the human body evolved on the planet Earth, so it, it's uh, right. You, uh, you you use gravity to swallow. I would imagine that some of these guys, some of these astronauts, uh, will actually they have to learn how to swallow without gravity. Yeah, it's. I mean, you you have peristaltic motion. It works to some extent, but I you know, I'm sure everybody's done this. You you get liquid down the wrong 
pipe and you just choke for no reason. I bet it, I bet it happens a lot. I think it does. I think there's, there's definitely some adjustment. They, I guess eating is not as hard as it, as it, as you might think it might be from what I've talked to some yeah. of these folks about, but, yeah. um, but liquid would be a little bit more challenging maybe. Yeah. Well, they, they use a lot of straws cause it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. it will, it does. And it actually, that's a, an issue too. Cause it, you know, you don't, you have a lot of electronics up there and the last thing you want to do is have water flowing, flying around the, uh, the cabin. So, Right. Um, there's uh, the, you know, keeping the water. It gets from, in your eye. It yeah. gets in, it can get in your eye. So Chris Hadfield is uh, one of the astronauts, and he he's the guy that did the uh, the David Bowie song and and did a video, and it's, it's got hundreds of thousands of views on on uh, YouTube. And I happened to hear on NPR, he was on NPR, and I happened to hear him talking about one of his difficulties up there. Um, he was on a spacewalk. Are you familiar with this line? He was on a spacewalk and some sort of liquid from his suit uh, got loose in his helmet and went in his eye, and it wasn't water, and so it started to sting. And so, you know, your instinct is to shut your eye, and, and shortly after that, it, it kind of, you know, there's no gravity, so you can't really control where the liquid's going. It kind of crawled, he says it crawled across his nose and got into his other eye. And so he's out in a suit, and you can't reach up and... and wipe your eye you're in the you know you've got the you've got the helmet on and they had so there's a cry that was a crisis and he described it you know uh in pretty good detail but they they basically talked him through he, you know he said i have a problem and uh they talked him through it they had he actually was venting his suit to to clear the contamination yeah it's pretty serious stuff and actually i think the water was coming from so they have they have drinking water in the suit uh, was it what he said it what i thought he said it wasn't water Oh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't. I don't know for sure. I don't. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it was on. Uh, it was on a couple of weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's basically his eyes were stinging. So yeah, it, I, it could be a water mixed with maybe some, some something in the you know in in, in the suit because they do they do run water through the suits to to cool the suit off and to heat. When, when you're out on a spacewalk, um, when you're in basically facing the sun when you're in, in right. that. So you go around the, the earth every 90 minutes, you have 45 minutes essentially of daylight and 45 minutes of, of nighttime. And uh, when you're up there, you have full exposure to the sun and, and it's you know hundreds of degrees in the sun uh, and very, very cold in the opposite direction in, in the dark. And the suit has to regulate the body temperature. Suits are very much like, uh, like little spaceships essentially that right. they have to use. Right. And, uh, they're made right here in Connecticut. We took a tour of that. If you go on uh, cttechjunkie.com, uh, do a search for Hamilton Sunstrand. You'll see our article. We we did a they they, were, they had us there for a couple of hours actually. It was pretty pretty neat. Yeah, it was to see quite that. a tour. But when they're out in these spacewalks, they're doing these spacewalks for eight hours plus. So uh, they have drinking water inside the suit that they can uh, you know drink some water while they're uh, conducting their mission. They tried food apparently. I was reading something about that. They tried initially to have some food in there too. That that didn't go over too well. So they, uh, they <laughs> I can't uh, imagine how that would have been easy. <laughs> they bulk yeah. up before they head out, but. Um, yeah, I think what happened there was his, the water leaked in the suit. And, you know, these suits are not, are not um, young. I mean, these, are, these suits have been yeah. around for a while. These suits were designed for the space shuttle program. Uh, you know, they were uh, designed probably in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, built in the 80s and 90s, and they've been used right. quite a bit. And uh, one of the challenges when we were out at Hamilton Sunstrand and talking to the folks there is they had to redesign the suit because the suits were initially designed uh, to go up on the space shuttle and come back. So you could uh, make the suit um, a little less uh, easy to fix on orbit because it was going to come back at the end of the mission anyhow, and you can refurbish it and put it back, put it back out there. And one of the big right. challenges that they had to do in preparation for the end of the shuttle program was to make these suits serviceable in orbit and changing how they work and how all the backpack, uh, you know, different, different things interact within the backpack that provides all the life support. And uh, it proved to be a pretty significant uh, change in how these suits are working and, and adapting those changes to uh, older suits that have been around for a while. So uh, there is a next generation space suit in the works uh, and that will be, uh, I don't know when they're gonna be done with that, but um, uh, that will Every one of them has a different soon. purpose, right? So they, uh, here on earth, uh, the suits weigh, uh, some of the suits weigh over 300 pounds. Yeah, they're very heavy and up in space it doesn't so, really matter, right? Right, it doesn't matter, but when you're, when you're down here, they train in them. It's, it's gotta be pretty challenging. Every one of these astronauts is, is so highly trained in terms of uh, not just their brain power, but physically as well. Yeah, no, it's, it, I think, you know, it's, it, it really, you got to be the full package. You got to have, uh, you know, be in excellent shape. You need, uh, as Rick Mastracchio has got two master's degrees and everything, everything else, you know, you yeah. need a lot of education, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, be in really good shape. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty I don't think I'm do. going out on a limb here uh, saying that most people don't realize what kind of uh, 
aer aeronautics uh, development, how, what kind of space equipment development is going on right here in their backyard. And it's one thing to have an astronaut from Waterbury, but there's a ton of stuff being constructed here for NASA and for, I mean, it, you know, I don't know how many things Hamilton Sunstrand is, is responsible for. It's Quite a, a bit. A yeah, and actually a lot of the equipment on the station. So they have, um, you know, they're, they're, again, one of the other challenges when the shuttle was decommissioned was that the shuttle used to bring water up to the space station. Uh, and it did, it did so basically, um, the, the water was its byproduct. So it was running fuel cells, which, by the way, were made in we're South Windsor, right? Here, right? that's right. UTC Power right. was a Connecticut company that, that manufactured the fuel cells for the space shuttle program. And uh, the fuel cells worked by taking uh, hydrogen and oxygen and, and creating electricity from those two uh, components. And the output, the, the exhaust, if you will, was water. So the shuttle used to uh, pull up to the station and the space station and, and dump off its excess water. And that's what was used for drinking water. It was very pure water. Um, right. And they often said it didn't have much of a taste to it because it was so pure. Um, but when right. that... See, after they've recycled it, it's, it's, it's even more pure than right. anything that, you know, people are drinking down here. And they're using now, they're, they're recycling, um, you know, this sounds kind of gross, but they're recycling the urine <laughs> and other wastewater. Yeah. They're actually capturing uh, the, the, the uh, moisture in the air. So, you know, coming off of uh, the astronaut who might, might be sweating a little bit while in orbit, you know, any moisture in the air is, is captured in also converted back into drinking water so that they're trying to uh, reclaim as much of that water as possible because it is a very 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 valuable substance on on orbit and very right. heavy to lift off to you know take water up to the station so uh, but hamilton exactly. was working on that we saw uh, some rooms where they were working on uh, on those devices and um and we have they're course, certainly not venting it if it's uh, wastewater no they're you know that maybe maybe there was a time when when they were but i uh, nowadays they're reusing everything and trying to uh to remain 100% sustainable. Yeah, up no. there. that's the whole. That's the whole goal. That is that is the goal. That's what you got to do. So we're uh, still waiting on uh, the launcher. It looks like everything is uh, looking good so far. So and, and it's funny. It almost looks like it's out in the middle of nowhere. It's actually there's actually quite a bit of infrastructure around this thing, but um, <laughs> but uh, it's fully fueled and they're going through all of their checklists and stuff. We'll put we'll put the NASA audio up shortly as we get a little bit closer. Liftoff is scheduled in about uh, about 10 minutes, 12 minutes from now. So it uh, should be happening pretty shortly, and we'll take a look at that. Um, so some other Connecticut connections, Doug. So the Mars rover, the new one. Oh, yeah. um, now, it has all this rocket sled technology and all sorts of crazy stuff that it did, but the parachute that it used to slow down before those rockets ignited was made here in Connecticut also. Um, so that's another Connecticut uh, aerospace connection there. And I, I would imagine that there's a ton of uh, you know, small subcontractors uh, here in the state that also make very precision parts, uh, very precise parts for, for the, uh, this thing as well. So I think the batteries... Uh... The original two rovers batteries were were made here, weren't they? they that that's right. Actually, the battery on the current one it was made here as well. So the that's right. uh, but that's a, it's a different battery. This larger rover has a different battery. Yeah, if I'm not it, mistaken. But. A little bit. Well, what it is is it has a um, a plutonium power source, so it's it is nuclear. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And what happens is is the the heat from that uh, from that plutonium is is uh, charging or it's converted into electricity and charges the battery that's on that rover. And that battery was made in Stonington by Yardney Electric's uh, Lithion Division. And they're about to move to Rhode Island, but uh, that was made here in Connecticut. Oh. And uh, yeah, I know it's, it's not, it's brutal. Um, my so father's a silver lining somewhere else. Yeah, my father's right. first job um, out of college was there. That's where my father uh, start, began his, uh, his working life, was at, uh, was at that place. And he worked on uh, the life support batteries that the Apollo astronauts used on the moon. So. Uh, Amazing. They've been making, you know, batteries. These are very highly specialized batteries that can withstand a lot. Um, interestingly enough, the so we sent two rovers to Mars in 2004. They're both solar powered. Uh, those solar panels charge those batteries that were made in Connecticut. Um, again, 2004. We're now what 2013. So that's almost nine years now, right? Um, yeah. The uh, this one rover it went uh, bit, bit the dust <laughs> literally because yeah. its, its solar panels got. Uh, you know, they're covered, with dust. covered yeah. with dust and they couldn't get it into, I guess it got stuck and they couldn't get it into a position to uh, survive the Martian winter. Because as you know, uh, in the winters here in Connecticut, even of all places, when you get into this time of year, the solar radiance is significantly reduced. And uh, anyone who's uh, got solar panels will know that at this time of year. Uh, on Mars, it's even worse because you're farther away from the sun to begin with. And those, those winters are really tough. So they can't get 
um, enough juice into the rover to uh, be able to operate it because it needs to maintain some heat to keep its electronics from freezing. Mars gets really, really pretty cold, and in the winter it gets really, really cold. So, right, and there's no water floating around there to rinse anything off. Yeah. No, there is no way. Yeah, actually, well, what's funny is, is that the, the rovers had very opportunistic things that occurred, like including having these little dust devils come by and, uh, and sweep the, uh, the dust off their, their solar panels. But I guess the, uh, the first rover, Spirit, got stuck somewhere, uh, couldn't right. get through the winter, and they tried communicating with it. But they lasted it. for years, right? right. They that lasted one, for years past where anybody thought oh, they would. They were designed to last 90 days, and, and it actually right. went, went a lot longer than that. Now, the, uh, the other one, so Spirit is, is uh, you know, uh, resting in peace on, <laughs> on the Martian landscape. <laughs> uh, somebody will come by and uh, pick it up at some point in the future, and uh, I'm sure it'll be... Uh, uh, yeah. Very happily, very very happily uh, received and covered with dust. But the other one, opportunity, is still working. So it just shows you just how resilient those batteries were that they designed there. So uh, pretty cool. We are under 10 minutes now for launch. So NASA TV is uh, running some uh, interviews here. We'll get ready to uh, pump up the audio from NASA in a minute when we get uh, closer to the launch period here. And the Soyuz uh, craft. Um, tend to lift off when they want them to. So as, as they're, they're less complex. They're really, you know, nothing simple in rocket science, but they're not like, you know, the, the real uh, overly complex system that the space shuttle was. And um, Doug, uh, for those watching, Doug came with me to uh, the Kennedy Space Center uh, about two and a half years ago. We were getting really close to watching the space shuttle launch. And, you know, these things are not easy to get to because you got to drag all your equipment with you. You got to uh, get up at the crack of dawn, or actually before the crack of dawn, drive out there, and then some little hardware glitch will ruin your day, and poor Doug right. got to miss it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was down there for a week, though, and it was a great experience nonetheless. But, Can't uh, complain. Can't complain. We were, the we were among the first uh, news media to see the, uh, the Dragon spacecraft. That's right. We got to go take a tour. That is a great shot of the uh, International Space Station. This was taken from a, I believe, from a Russian Soyuz craft there, so... Um, it is quite big, and there's, uh, and I try to post this, uh, if you follow me on Facebook, which I welcome you to do, uh, we, we uh, everybody else is, right? Uh, no harm, we, no, no harm. harm, go ahead, follow me, but we, uh, whenever th there is bright um, overhead views of the space station, there are certain times of, of the month where you can see the space station fly overhead, and it is uh, really incredible. It's a big, bright dot, and it, it moves very steadily across the sky. It is really remarkable to, uh, to check that out. So I try to post whenever uh, some, good, some good evening viewing opportunities are available. It's really worth, uh, worth seeing. And uh, that big bright dot has uh, six people on it at any given time. It's really uh, it's an incredible thing. So it, there's a lot of science going on up there. They're learning how to live in space uh, to prepare for some of these missions down the road. So it's, uh, it's a pretty... Uh, Pretty, uh, it's a significant achievement. And, uh, you know, and coming back to Rick Mastracchio, uh, he was on the mission that equipped the first crew. So he went up on the space shuttle in 2000. Uh, they got the, turned all the lights on. They brought all the equipment on board. They basically got the uh, station equipped and ready for habitation. And it has been inhabited since 2000. So he started that work. Wow. He got all the stuff there. Um, they've done, a, you know, tens of hours or, you know, hundreds of hours in, in spacewalks and, uh, assembling this thing, and it is uh, operating and has been inhabited for the last 13 years or so. It's, uh, it's an absolutely crucial mission to get the thing up and running first. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, incredibly complex, and it's and it's working. And uh, there's going to be some changes soon. The Russians are going to uh, remove. So there's Russian modules and there's American modules on board. Uh, so the Russians are going to actually be taking one of their modules off. Um, I don't. I think they're going to just dump it into the ocean somewhere, and they're going to launch a new one. Uh, to replace uh, that one. So there's, uh, you know, there is a modular construction, you know, it's like a modular home. You can kind of take parts off and add them. So uh, they will be uh, doing that shortly. So uh, we'll see that development there. What's kind of neat is these, these Soyuz spacecraft that are flying to the station um, to take the astronauts uh, and the cosmonauts up, uh, those spacecraft are parked uh, on the station until they leave. So the Soyuz that are, that are taking these uh, three astronauts up will uh, dock with the station, and they will remain there until they come home. There's another crew, I believe, that left yesterday, um, and they got back in the Soyuz that they came on. And it was funny, they, you know how you have to move cars around, Doug, you know? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so they, they had to move, um, they had to do a move where they, they put, put some astronauts in a Soyuz, they detached it from the station, uh, and moved it to another spot and reattached it. So, uh, and that was wow. in preparation for this one to arrive here. So it's, uh, you know, we've, we've got a really functional 
uh, space station here. And uh, there's a lot of traffic that comes by. So there's um, unmanned cargo vessels that, that will arrive on a very regular basis that deliver um, uh, very necessary supplies, experiments. Um, uh, what's interesting is that the only craft that can take things back to Earth is the SpaceX Dragon right now. So the, uh, the shuttle used to be the, the thing that they depended on to do that. Um, but the only way to bring cargo back is through space, the SpaceX uh, commercial spaceship. So uh, it's a pretty, uh, becoming a very important part of the science mission. Here's a shot of our astronauts uh, on board. I think the astronaut on the, on the left there, the one that's kind of covered by that thing dangling, that I believe is Rick Mastracchio. Gotcha. So he's in there. He's got the thumbs up, it looks like. That's a good sign when they, they give the thumbs up. They're not, yeah. they're not unstrapping themselves, so we're, <laughs> we're looking like it's pretty good. I'm going to pull up the NASA audio because we are definitely we're four minutes from launch here. So let's pull up, uh, pull up the NASA audio here. I'm going to get the right thing. Closed or uh, are closing their helmets. And uh, at this point, there's uh, an officially is where they insert a launch key, and it is a real key that's in inserted into the uh, firing room uh, for the launch at the T minus four minute mark uh, here. You don't want to lose your car keys, Doug. No. <laughs> hydrogen purge will begin, and uh, the booster propellant tank pressurization will begin at uh, about 11 minutes after the hour. It's been a very uh, smooth countdown, uh, fairly quiet uh, as well. As you see, a beautiful uh, morning at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, uh, just under four minutes to launch. It's a beautiful day for a launch, isn't it? Looks that way. Apparently one of the fun things uh, for media is to cover one of these because it's a real adventure to go out to one of these uh, launches as, as American media. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's probably uh, more remote places you can go, but this is looks like quite a trip. Yeah, and the training is done in, in, outside of Moscow in Star City. So they, they train there. When we did the interview that we, that we uh, ran a little bit earlier, um, it was right before he left for Kazakhstan. So they do all their training outside of Moscow at Star City, and then they uh, head over here when they're ready to go. Three minutes to launch. So we've got three we minutes to go. We haven't, haven't mentioned that movie, uh, the Gravity movie, very much, but uh, Chris Hadfield, the astronaut uh, that was on NPR, recommended it, said that uh, the, uh, the scenes from outside, the, from out in space, uh, were very realistic. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. Well, you know, it was funny uh, when when Rick Mastracchio was getting interviewed. He um, uh, he was uh, you know the question that he got a lot from the other media. So the way it works when they do these inter these satellite interviews is each member of the media gets about five minutes uh, of his time, and a lot of them are live broadcasts. So all the local sure. Connecticut stations did it. Uh, he got asked about that a lot, and he said he thought it was a very entertaining movie. That was his. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, the, uh, Chris Hadfield uh, was actually in an audience that was screening it, and they called him up on stage afterwards, and he, he apparently was very diplomatic about parts of the film that he didn't think were very realistic. But he did say that they did an amazing job uh, with the depiction of what it's like outside the space station. And I think it shows too that people have a real, you know, the taxpayers and those of us who fund these programs really have an, an interest in seeing these things continue. That you know, I don't think the, oh, yeah. you know, the box it, it it's brought in over two hundred million dollars at the box office. I don't think people anticipated it doing that well. Um, at least the wow. uh, management wow. of these, uh, yeah. So it's it's been a it's a great film and and anything that I think from NASA's perspective they love anything that keeps the public interested in this program. Um, for obvious reasons, uh, because it's a, it, it's perilous. Well, they need right some now. funding at this point. Yeah, they, they, need, they need the support. New funding. There's new, just like Rick Mastracchio said, there's new vehicles coming yeah. that uh, he wants a, to take part in uh, launching. And, and that's part of why the shuttle, you know, really had to end when it did. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy over whether or not it should have continued until they had something else. But uh, it was draining a lot of money out of out of the funds that are available for these these missions. And um, you know, it's given, it's freed up funds to develop the next thing. One thing we didn't talk about um, is the, you know, that, that asteroid mission. There's a whole new American space vehicle being developed. It's going to be as big as those uh, moon rockets we were talking about earlier. So uh, there's some real stuff happening. It's just a matter of 
uh, the will being there to continue funding it. And I think that's going to be the real, the real challenge. Well, the orbiter was, was an orbiter. So it, uh, I, think, I think it's realistic. It's uh, not overly controversial to say that we maxed out on what we could realistically use that vehicle for. That's true. I think, and, and it couldn't work with the next step. Yeah, and it couldn't get further than where it was, which was right. in orbit. It's literally an orbiter. That's yeah. what it's what it was designed for. And sooner or later, uh, I think eventually we're going to have to move some asteroids. Let's move them, and, or at least we're going to want to be able to move them at some point. I mean, you know, who knows what's really floating around out there? I know, I know they're tagging a lot of objects. We've talked about this before, but they should be tagging more of them. All right, we're ten seconds away. Identifying. Here we go. Here we go. Intermediate. Engines have lit. Off it goes. And we have lift off. Rick Mastracchio is off, of the Soyuz off to uh, the, TMA 11M space the space station on a truly Olympic leap, delivering three more wow. crew members to the International Space yeah. Station on a historic mission to continue the seamless transition of humans and on their own. That relay, blue section there is a and space. Uh, is is uh, for the Olympics. So as you know, the Olympics are coming to Five Russia. Seconds. They are carrying the Olympic torch with them to orbit. They're going to take it out on a spacewalk and then bring it back in and then bring it back to Earth and light it. So it is uh, there's an Olympic uh, theme here. All right, it is off. All about marketing. The yeah. Olympics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything seems to look like it's gone off without a hitch. So far, it's a lot, a lot of components here that that have to work correctly. But yeah. it's a very reliable rocket, and we'll probably see some shots inside the uh, the cabin. Yeah. Passing through the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the vehicle. One minute. What do they call that? The uh, flight, the it's the roll maneuver, right? Yeah. What, yeah. We, what you do is you um, get up to a certain altitude. You then pitch over because going straight up is not very efficient to getting into orbit. Right. Right. So you need to start getting some lateral motion. Exactly. So you kind of arc over. Um, Everything's fine on board. Everything is nominal. Everything is nominal, they said. And we can copy loud and clear. I'm a little delayed on what I can hear, so my apologies if I'm not filling in any. Okay. any uh, <laughs> right, that's okay. You're picking up. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a little bit behind. The fact that we got this working at all tonight, Doug, is a miracle. <laughs> it is a miracle. It is, and it's a good thing we didn't have. Nobody was depending on us in terms of, uh, you know, yeah, exactly. having enough oxygen throughout the broadcast or anything like that. For escape power jettison. <laughs> Although we did make it work, you made it work. I was here to test. All right, so now there goes the uh, and jettison of the uh, four strap-on boosters. Four strap-on boosters have completed their job. Detached they away in an altitude of about 28 it's a pretty miles. Pretty cool shot. You'll see it in a minute, Doug, when your stream catches up. Miles per hour. What we'll do next time is we'll get the video to loop back to you, so you can at least see what I'm seeing. Sure. Hopefully, we'll uh, catch up with some of the uh, upgrades and uh, well downgrades that are happening in the systems that we're using. Right. All right. Looks like. Uh, there's a shot now inside, and uh, oops, there it comes. Comes back. So Rick Mastracchio is on the uh, end there. In great shape. Uh, now it's and the weather is and the uh, shroud is now separated uh, from well, the vehicle. you can see the, uh, the boosters kind of tumbling in the distance. Yeah. I'm, I'm still behind you, but when they did separate it, they hung around for a while. Three minutes into the flight. So we're three minutes into the flight right now. It's what now the shot we're seeing that you'll see in a minute, Doug, is um, they have two cameras inside the. Uh, uh, inside the Soyuz that are going to capture this uh, launch and uh, you're going to see this little teddy bear kind of dangling from the ceiling and once they get into orbit you're going to see them start to float it's really they do this on all the launches there's always something dangling from there they had an angry oh, bird yeah, there it is. One of, yep, yeah. so they had an angry bird floating on one of them uh, <laughs> and uh, once they get into orbit it'll it'll start to float which is really cool to watch and thank you everyone for tuning in it looks like he's going to be okay here you still have a, quite a few thousand miles to go. Well, it's a matter of just, you know, they, you have to get enough um, altitude and speed in order to yeah. put yourself in a, in a stable orbit. And there's a, you know, this is very difficult when you think about what's happening here. The space station is, is orbiting the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. And you right. have to catch chase up to it. Down. it. Yeah. yeah, chase it down and catch up to it and do, do it perfectly. Um, there is an automated docking procedure, so uh, the, uh, you know, there is obviously some manual overrides if need be, but 
um, the, uh, the docking is, is an automated procedure for the most part. And uh, Chris Gephardt, who couldn't join us tonight from nasaspaceflight.com, they have a, a, a premium section of their site where they have some really neat videos of uh, so the space shuttle's docking from inside, so you can see you know, what it's like to, you know, everyone working together to get that, uh, get that docking to work properly. Right. And I'm always, I'm, I, I get more and more nervous about how much junk is up there in orbit. It's a, it's a growing that's, that's problem. That's the premise of the film, right? That's the premise of the Gravity film, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it is. I haven't watched yeah. it yet, but I believe that's the premise there. And, and there is a lot of junk in space. And it's not staying up there forever. And yeah. it was also Five minutes into flight. Right. Third stage is ignited, so they're, they are in good shape. I misspoke before. I said there was only two stages. There's actually three. So. 105 statute miles. Yeah, they are big, big rockets. Also, is now being propelled by the single engine of the third stage, providing 30 tons of thrust. It will burn for the. There are next quite a few educational. So. Uh, well, they're games, but they're fairly educational games on uh, on the iPhone uh, that kind of show you how to build these things in sections. In the to the uh, left. Uh, share the, you know you can use the Soyuz pieces. You can use old old uh, Apollo technology. Yeah, there's there's a really neat. Um, a uh, game for the for the PC and Mac called Kerbal Space Program. So if you have kids that are interested in this, I, I would really highly recommend checking it out because you you really gain an appreciation for how hard it is to do what uh, the Russians are doing today and what what our NASA astronauts do as well. And and it's uh, it's not an easy thing because you really have to make sure you have enough fuel, um, that you get enough speed to you know get into a stable orbit. Well, there's a lot of math involved in this too, so it's it's going to be a particularly Kerbal, right? It's a tremendous math. Yeah, and what's nice is that builder. you you can do it without the math, but you quickly learn. Um, <laughs> you can do a lot of yeah. trial and error, or you can try to do it with the math. I do yeah. it with the trial and error method. <laughs> but, <laughs> the launch occurred yeah. on time at ten. And it's very important that all these burns happen as long as you know as they need to. It was interesting when um, we were down for the SpaceX launch. Um, they had an engine go out on launch and. When you lose an engine, you lose you know some some power to orbit. So the the uh, SpaceX uh, uh, Falcon uh, engine on the rocket uh, knew that it lost an engine and burned the other engines for a little bit longer to get uh, to get the speed and, and altitude it needed to get into orbit. So right now the Soyuz on its third stage is using a single engine. So it's very important that that engine at this stage uh, burns correctly and for the the right amount of time. So. Um, but, uh, yeah, I misspoke earlier. I think I said that we went down and saw the dragon, but you're right, it's the Falcon. Well, That's the Falcon is the rocket and the dragon's the capsule. The so dragon's you, so the capsule where people, yeah, right. gotcha. I don't know if, I think it was, it was there for one of the trips we took there, but. Yeah. Everything is nominal. All right, looks like everything is nominal according to the uh, launch announcer there. Still looks like there's gravity in there. <laughs> yep, they're not there yet. Well, what's, um, the closer you get to orbit, the higher the G-forces get. So right. they're under a lot of... Just about one more minute remaining in They're increasing flight. speed. Once the third right. stage still delivers right. the Soyuz to orbit and the module is separated, there's a series of pre-programmed commands... And now it's about another be minute and the engine will shut down and it'll be in orbit. So let's keep an eye on that, um, that little thing they're dangling there. time tagged commands. And they allow so once those engines shut off, you go from to you know two to three Gs of you know two to three times the Earth's gravity. You go from that to weightless in an instant. It's really uh, thrust to no thrust. Yeah, it's a remarkable feeling. From what I, I've been talking to astronauts, that was one of the remarkable parts of their flight. Um, you know, the, the the launch process itself is a pretty violent procedure, but the uh, that that very quick shift from G forces to nothing is a pretty uh, stomach churning event. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of folks get sick. Yeah, that's part of the deal. Part of the training, I guess. Yeah, that's part of the deal. There's been some great films about uh, uh, that kind of training. Yeah, or oh, The Right Stuff was one of them. The Right Stuff is a, just a tremendous, tremendous film. And I think that was probably, you know, uh, jing, kind of jingoistic and, and po you know, positive, mm -hmm. positive film. But it, it, oh, there it, it goes. didn't... It, now they Didn't just want to wash everything. Uh, they, you see that jolt? They are now uh, in orbit. And as you can see now, things are floating around the cockpit. <laughs> and uh, Rick Mastracchio is in space now for the fourth time. 
and when I interviewed him, he said he had no, um, uh, no plans to leave just yet either. So I think he, uh, he's yeah. going to stick around. He's, he's enjoying it. He's going to be in demand. It really depends on which way NASA goes and which way. Uh, well, that's it. I mean, it could be that he's going to want to stay there because, you know, if, if they're going to send somebody to an asteroid, the, the, the experienced astronauts tend to be the ones that get to go first. So, right, right. Uh, busily uh, getting uh, spacecraft acclimated to orbit right now. And this is where all that training comes in. They've probably practiced this routine and this, these procedures uh, many times. And you think yeah. about the language barriers here also, because we have uh, an American, a Russian, and a, a Japanese astronaut who all have to understand each other. Um, when, during our, the interview, uh, he said the, uh, it was a bit of a, of a challenge learning Russian, and he, he was not... Uh, Rick Bashrakia said he wasn't very, um, as an engineer, his language was not his uh, primary. <laughs> right, not his strong suit, absolutely. Yep. But I got a feeling he's, he's probably command, he's much better at languages uh, than be he'd be willing to admit of, uh, anyway. Deploying yeah. the antenna and the solar arrays on the spacecraft. So now they're getting ready to deploy the uh, solar arrays and the antennas, and you can see something floating by there, so. Yeah, they're definitely busy. Yeah, no, it's a pretty busy process here to get uh, everything configured. And, and there's a bit of a race here because, you know, typically they had a couple of days to, to, you know, get things settled and, and, and before they went for the docking maneuver. Now uh, they're going to be catching up with the space station immediately. So it's, a, it's right. probably a little bit more intense of, a, of an exercise. And we're seeing uh, Russian mission control right now on the screen. So we'll stick with this for a little bit, Doug. I think we're almost uh, to the point where we're not going to see much more until they, they dock... Uh, probably around five or six in the morning, our time. Right. I'm not sure we're going to get up for that, but <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll show the video afterward. But it looks like um, the, uh, the Russian uh, spacecraft has performed its task of getting them into orbit. So uh, he is safely on orbit, and the next uh, couple hours will be uh, all that catch-up maneuvers. But um, it's always a relief when those engines cut off and they're where they're supposed to be. So that... Uh, that is a good thing. Yeah. So it's, it's always remarkable. Always an amazing feat to get up into orbit. Yeah, it's it's still not an easy thing. I mean, it, you'd think it's a routine process by now, but it's uh, we've not yet mastered. Most, most the, definitely not. It's yeah, not, it's not like not uh, taking a flight somewhere for sure. So. Yeah. Now, sooner or later, they're going to be launching from orbit. Launching other vehicles from orbit. Yeah, no, I think that's that's, a, that's probably something in the works. You know, one of the things that um, if Chris was on, he could talk about a little bit more is there, this this notion of these Lagrange points, which are um, points in space where uh, you can put things, and they, they get kind of locked in an orbit between two bodies, you know, between the Earth and the Sun, or uh, you know, just equidistant uh, yeah. gravitational forces. Yeah, right. you can just put it there, and it stays there. And and one of the things that they're talking about is actually. Uh, creating little space stations that you can put there that would be refueling depots. Remember we talked about the fact that you got to bring all your fuel up with you. If you're going to the moon, you got to bring everything with you. Uh, but right. if you could set up these refueling stations out there, you could not have to bring as much up with you and then pick more up that was launched at an earlier time uh, at one of these uh, Lagrange point stations. So a uh, pretty neat thing you could do there if, you know, when we get to that point. A lot, there's a lot to, to, get, to do to get there. Yeah, if they can For find sure. big chunks of water out there in the asteroids, they'd be theoretically able to synthesize, synthesize yeah. that into fuel as well. So. For sure. Well, Doug, I think um, there's not going to be much more to see at this point because we're in orbit and we're looking at a green screen here <laughs> that uh, will probably not change for a few hours. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us. For This was an experiment, really, to try to figure out um, if we could even get this to work, <laughs> which... Uh, which we did. And what's funny is, is that what worked a, an hour ago doesn't always work the, the following hour. But uh, yeah. um, we, we uh, unfortunately couldn't get our guest on. We were, we would have been really great to kind of give us some, uh, uh, some info on, on how all this stuff works. But uh, he was uh, unable to join us at the last minute, unfortunately. And, uh, but we will, uh, uh, I am sure, get, um, get him back. Maybe pull up your video. There you are. So I'm sure we'll get him uh, back again in the future for future missions. And we'll keep an eye on what Rick Mastracchio is doing because he's going to be up there for a while. I would imagine he's probably going to do some interviews from orbit. So we'll try to uh, maybe get ourselves on the list for one of those. 
Um, and I know sure. he'll be doing uh, a lot with the Waterbury kids. He did send up a, um, he's carrying with him uh, something from the Waterbury kids, this geocaching travel bug. So uh, it's a little, it looks like a dog tag and it's got a barcode on it. And have you ever tried geocaching, Doug? It's really kind of a fun thing. No, I've read about it though. Um, it's definitely a good project. Yeah, so you can, uh, you can go out with your phone and, and there's these little caches buried all over the place. In fact, there's like two or three right by my house. You can, there's, there's one in a tree uh, in the park, in the uh, open space land next door. Um, what, what people do is they, they have these little caches, like little plastic boxes that are buried somewhere. Um, and you, you can leave things in there and take things with you, little tchotchkes and that kind of thing. And, and these geocaching travel bugs are trackable. So when you put one, you know, the tracking bug in there, uh, the next person who comes by grabs it and then types in the code on the website, geocaching.com, and can see where it went. So what's going to happen is, is this uh, travel bug is orbiting the Earth for the next six months with, uh, with the astronaut there. And when he comes back, uh, he's going to bring it back to the kids in the Waterbury School, and they'll probably leave it in one of the caches, and it'll start... Uh, working its way around uh, around the space uh, around the, the space of Earth, I guess, not around space. Yeah, anymore, yeah. But, uh, the different caches. Right. Yeah, that's right. it. So, um, but I think we're going to end our stream here. So, Doug, thank you for uh, joining us and filling in. Uh, I know you weren't planning Happy on to be here. being a co-host, <laughs> but thanks for uh, <laughs> looking stuff up while we were filling some time sure. here. Uh, so, sure. uh, we will uh, probably do one of these again. I'd love to hear from all of you. I know we didn't get too many people chatting with us, but. Uh, I know there was a number of people watching, so if, uh, I'd love to get your feedback on, on what worked and what didn't, and we will uh, try to make these more interesting in the future, but I think it worked out uh, pretty good. And now I've got a lot of stuff to unplug, so I'm going to go and start that. <laughs> All right. All right, good. I will see you soon. Thanks, thanks again, for everybody, for watching, and we are signing off.